Sorry, do we have any uh, non-designers in the room? Anyone that doesn't have design in their title? Cool. Um, so essentially, yeah, seeing it systems, this talk got really weird. Um, I wanted to make it more practical, but these topics and this subject matter is really, um, it's hard to communicate. So <laughs> let's gonna see where we go. Uh, I just wanna clarify something as well. When I say a native Ethereum design language, I'm not talking about a design system, which is a systemization of interface components. I'm talking about a generative language in the same way that we have English or something like that. How can we create composable generative elements? that actually create a design, a process of design that then can be adapted to a, uh, to a complex system. Sounds totally normal. Uh, cool, so the situation. So basically, we invented the internet uh, in the mid-90s, mid-90s, mid, mid, middle of the century, um, and it's basically shaped it to our world, so it's a product of our world at that point. Um, and then sort of uh, with the invention of the World Wide Web, 1990 to Berners-Lee, uh, we arrived at sort of the consumer-friendly internet. Um, it, and it, it incentivized us to feed it our information, um, and it transformed from being a space, so a destination that you actually visit, to being uh, fused with the very sort of information systems of our civilization. And then obviously, everything that happened after 2016 was a catalyst for us thinking and trying to question what, what's happening with these systems, what is happening with the internet, and how is it um, how is it reshaping society? How is it reshaping our civilization? And so my question is, my thought, one of these thoughts, is that essentially Ethereum and the related technologies are not so much of an, an invention of Vitalik and friends, uh, but an inevitable emergent expression of the internet itself with Vitalik, etc., as a medium through which this was expressed. Um, another way to think about this is that for the longest time we've had a, a sort of a simulated reality in the computer um, an actual reality in which it lived. Um, but quoting Paul Edwards, he's an academic that um, studies and uh, lectures in uh, society and um, technology studies. He says, uh, programming can produce strong sensations of power and control because the computer produces an internally consistent, if externally incomplete micro world, a simulated world entirely within the meat machine itself. So that is where most tools produce effects on a wider world of which they are only a part, the computer contains its own worlds in miniature, in the micro world, as in children's make-believe, the power of the programmer is absolute. And the problem is that now, as the internet has started to interface with these systems of society, um, the simulated reality of the computer is brittle and it cannot handle, um, it is not capable of adapting um, and responding um, to the pressures, um, the challenges that it's now facing. Um, and uh, the best way to phrase this, I think, is in this essay, uh, Childhood's End, that came out on January 1st this year by George Dyson. He essentially says that the genius, sometimes deliberate, sometimes accidental, of the enterprises now on such a steep ascent is that they have found their way through the looking glass and emerged as something else. The models are no longer models. The search engine is no longer a model of human knowledge. It is human knowledge. What began as a mapping of human meaning now defines human meaning and has begun to control rather than simply catalog or index human thought. No one is at the controls. So, this is basically my vibe. We live in an age of planetary computing. We've reached the limits of design and Ethereum might help us extend them. Or, in another way of explaining it, how do we get to galaxy brain design? Um, all right, so just an intermission. Who is this guy? You're probably thinking I'm kind of weird. Some of these topics are real strange. This is me. This is a friendlier version of me. Uh, I'm a product designer at Consensus. I work on the Rimble component library. For about two years I've been researching this topic, trying to understand what has been happening uh, since sort of 2016 and what has been happening um, since then and also before then that was preceding this whole, this whole event. Um, cool, so basically, yeah, what's going on? Uh, nobody knows is what I've discovered, not even the people in charge. This is Casey Newton on Twitter. He interviewed a YouTube CEO at CodeCon and she said we work really hard to understand what's happening on it, on YouTube. So the people that run these platforms don't even know what's going on anymore. Uh, and, well actually this is everywhere. So um, you should all be familiar with this. Facebook being used to dis distribute state propaganda. Uh, Facebook again being used to incite violence and genocide in Myanmar. Um, this one's a bit more positive, actually. I thought this was fun. So basically, um, teens have big parties in LA, they create an Insta account for the party, and people have to request to follow it. If you get in, if you get it approved, it basically means it's your invite. 
they did not design that. Um, this is this is this is an interesting one. So Airbnb says we want to belong anywhere. I'm sure you're all staying in Airbnbs. It's this whole idea of this sort of global <laughs> kind of global mode of living. Um, anyway, so Barcelona locals say that uh, basically see the service as a pestilence, which is very far from the aspirational image they're trying to proje uh, project, effectively saying that Airbnb is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> um, so does anyone here know Katie? This is her LinkedIn profile. No, I don't, I don't think so. Anything out of the ordinary here? Anyone know what's up with Katie? Is this a real person? Yes, <laughs> partial credit. She is a product of machine learning, but what you're not going to get is that she was also designed by a spy, a Russian spy, in order to recruit informants in Washington through LinkedIn. <laughs> And this is also done uh, by the Chinese, allegedly, as well. Uh, this is a fun one. So Uber, grannies uh, in running shoes are delivering ramen for Uber right here in Japan. <laughs> and, uh, and then how YouTube radicalized Brazil. So these are two times investigators that went down to Brazil um, in order to understand what's happening down there. And they observed, or they believe they've got the evidence, or they published this evidence, um, observing that uh, YouTube's recommendation engine um, led to the rise in popularity of Jair Bolsonaro, and led to his election subsequently. So, um, oh yeah, <laughs> this is really something. So in this article, there's a person by the name of Pedro de Rochi, and he says, we have something here that we call the dictatorship of the like. Reality, he said, is shaped by whatever message goes most viral. So we're probably thinking what the hell is going on, because no one explicitly designed Facebook to incite violence, or YouTube to radicalize Brazilians, or Airbnb to reshape affordability in cities all around the world. Or LinkedIn to be used by rec to recruit informants for foreign intelligence in other countries. Um, and I think I've figured this out. I think it's the root cause is the Silicon Valley formula. It's pretty simple. I'm sure you all know it. Uh, you basically take one young, self-assured male, white male, uh, give them a bunch of cash, and then they change the world, and they impose themselves on the planet to make it better, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the issue with this is that um, is, is essentially scale. Um, it's Silicon Valley's obsession, and it's tied to the VC model and the actual power dynamics, or sorry, the, the power law returns around how the, um, these VC business models make their money. And the issue with scale inherently is that it leads to complexity. Now, complex systems, uh, complex systems are those where a system is more than the sum of its parts. <laughs> and, and effectively, the issue here is that um, we, we can't actually predict their behavior. So a complex system is one where we, cannot, we, do, we simply cannot map or model all the different interactions, all the different elements of that system, and therefore they're producing the emergent effects that I showed you, which is exactly the problem. Um, emergence is a classical uh, element or a classical property or output of any complex system. And it basically says it's stuff that you cannot possibly have imagined uh, when sort of manifesting from these things. Uh, oh yeah, so essentially one other way to reframe this is um, Dr. Ian Malcolm's famous words. Mm. So, in a simple system, you're all designers, except for like five of you, um, there's a simple cause and effect, right? You have a like button, and then you, it's tied to a counter, and it goes up and you feel good about yourself. Um, in a complex system, what happens is that um, cause might still be tied to effect, but then that effect might be tied to other effects as well. So you have these second and third and fourth order effects that lead to the, some of the examples that I showed you earlier in the, in the talk. And so, um, yeah, the fundamental problem we have here is that we can't fully know all the unintended effects of our design choices. Um, in a complex system, a single cause might have any kind of um, effect. Um, for an example, if this is tied to a counter in a simple system, I mean, it's, it's not a very, um, it, it's simple, it cannot be uh, manipulated um, to any great degree. But if the, if the like button is tied to a recommendation engine that is built by a company that has designed a business model to incentivize time on site in order to sell ad inventory, all of those design elements lead to some of the examples I showed you before, radicalization of people, um, distributing propaganda, and so on and so forth. So they're used by actors outside the system in politics and culture, etc., in ways that were never intended. Uh, so has anyone read this book? And, and, no? Oh, man, it's really good. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so um, James Bridle, he, he, he's written a bunch of essays um, around the sort of this concept of the new dark age, 
um, and then he published this book uh, that came out at the start of this year, or maybe the end of last. But he essentially says that what is needed is not new technology, uh, but new metaphors, a meta language for describing the world that complex systems have wrought. A new shorthand is required, one that simultaneously acknowledges and addresses the reality of a world in which people, politics, culture, and technology are utterly enmeshed. And so what I'm proposing, if you will, is that we need some kind of third layer. Uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s, for anyone that was around those days, it was basically all there was was UI. You did UI design and that was your thing. And then obviously Don Norman invented UX and, it's, and applied it in sort of a computing context in the mid 90s, but it didn't find its way into web design as a practice until sort of what, 2005, 6, 7, 8, and so on. And basically UX subsumed UI um, as, a, as a cohesive collective practice. And my thought is that a third layer is going to um, subsume UX as well. And it's gonna be for the design of complex systems or adapting complex systems. So the question is, where can we find uh, a new design language? And I want to really establish that it's not a process of creation, but revelation. We don't need to invent anything new. Everything that we need has already, has already been explored, has been published, um, has been talked about, and exists in many different disciplines right now, today. Um, one example um, of how we can find this, this process of revelation facilitated, uh, this is John Boyd, Air Force pilot. This is a happier John Boyd. Uh, he, did what, he invented what's called the aerial attack study. So in the, in the mid-20th uh, mid century, I think it was around the 60s, um, it was believed that dogfighting, aerial dogfighting, was far too complex to ever be objectively mapped and defined, um, and that no objective tactics manual could ever be created. He uh, just applied physics to that problem, it wasn't that hard. And um, he basically determined that in any aerial dogfight, uh, the position and velocity of your enemy compared to yourself is all you need to know in order to understand what uh, what maneuvers they have available and what you can do to counter them. Uh, similarly, uh, so this is the Yoshizawa Wranglet system. Um, up until before their, their system was uh, developed, sorry, um, communicating how to make origami was a very complicated process. That we just didn't have um, a system in place that could cohesively or clearly communicate um, how to make these folds. And so essentially all they did was create a superior symbolic language to better communicate how to go through this process. They didn't do anything new, they didn't invent anything new, they just took what was there and they updated it and incorporated different symbolic, uh, symbolic diagrams from other professions, or other uh, disciplines, sorry. So how do you design for complexity? Um, I've got no idea, <laughs> and that's kind of the point. Um, but I do think we need to go deeper, deeper down the stack, so to speak. And um, the first thing to consider is that the system should be our primitive. So a system is scale free, and we're in an age now where scale has um, evolved these systems or basically incentivized these systems to grow at a planetary scale. A system is scale free, it means that it can be as small as a single cell or as large as a universe. And systems are everywhere. You are all familiar with them. You each have a system for how you navigate a city or improve your memory um, or how you go about your day. A morning routine could be considered a system. And we are very familiar with, these, um, with this as a concept and as a construct. And you're already designing in systems anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the transition here is can we think less about outputting objects and outputting relationships, knowing that they're going to shape um, whatever it is that, that we want to emerge. So effectively saying that um, objects as a natural output uh, are, are a natural output from any set of relationships and interactions that they facilitate. Um, moving away from the problem solution as a binary and think because some one person's solution can be another person's problem and understanding that there are no, in, like in a simple system, maybe there is um, a meaningful way for a problem solution, solution uh, binary to actually work, but in these complex systems, um, it, not so much. And also, actually, um, the solution implies that a problem can be solved, uh, but any solution is actually only temporary. Uh, this is important as well. We design um, independently. We design as if we're designing a single system, uh, but we need to design for interdependence. And we need to understand how the systems outside of us are unconsciously shaping our design practices and, and our biases and so on and so forth. Um, I think a really great, this is Benjamin Bratton, design theorist. Um, I think a really great point of view on this or articulation of this was at a talk he gave last year where he said that uh, he suspected, or he proposed, 
that the insurance industry has contributed more to car design than the automotive industry itself. And this is another um, really interesting uh, diagram I found. So basically, how do these, in, in the case of this worker, imagine you're, <laughs> imagine you're that worker, how do all of these interlapping uh, systems influence how you design, how you practice, how you think? Um, and this is where it gets interesting. So moving away from designing interactions to designing incentives in order to encourage those interactions. Um, how can we design uh, modes of value and, and opinion, belief, social reputation, or status systems? How can we design those towards achieving our aims? Um, how can we move from thinking in non-social terms to social terms? Something that Ethereum does very well um, is acknowledge the implicit social relationships and design for them in its consensus mechanism. Uh, how do we go from designing with direct control, trying to get clear cause and effect, or design for clear cause and effect, uh, to indirect control, where it's not understanding that it's not possible for us to have every single uh, answer to every single design so-called problem, um, but we need to be able to figure out ways to shape and influence these things um, even well after we've actually stepped aside. And how do we acknowledge that we ne now need to design from static systems to adaptive systems? And obviously, once again, Ethereum is very good for this, um, with its composability and its capacity to be forked. Um, one of the biggest challenges that di digital static systems have is, um, sorry, um, <laughs> one of, um, is in their inability to, to adapt. So this gives us a model for how we can get around that. Um, yeah, so also, essentially, um, we need to sort of I propose, I mean, you can do this or not. <laughs> My suggestion is that we should consider, um, consider ourselves effectively in a cycle of creation and adaptation. And both the user and ourselves are both um, going through this cycle as well. So just as the user creates and we adapt, we create and they adapt. Um, and, and thinking of it less from a hierarchical perspective and a set of interrelationships. Um, yeah, so I don't know how to actually finish this talk uh, <laughs> because this topic is still one that I'm struggling to be able to communicate cohesively or clearly. Um, but this is from um, Laura Schwalst. Um, she says, a flower is not a flower. Um, it is made only of non-flower elements, sunshine, clouds, time, space, earth, minerals, gardeners, and so on. A true flower contains the whole universe, and if we return any one of those non-flower elements to its source, there will be no flower. So just thinking about the uh, systems are in and through everything that we're doing. Cool. Thank you.